Hey guys, in this video we're going to go over the topic of your OCR gateway biology, genes, inheritance and selection. To follow along with this video then you can get the checklist in the free reading guide which is over on my website. Gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for a characteristic. Genome is all the genes in a body, or all of the genes that you have. A gamete is going to be a sex cell, so in um, humans that is a sperm or the egg. Chromosome is bundled up DNA. Alleles are different versions of genes. Dominant means you only need one gene to express a characteristic. Recessive means you need two identical recessive genes to express a characteristic. Homozygous means your genes are the same. Heterozygous means your genes are different. Genotype is what genes you have. And phenotype is a collection of characteristics that you have. If you know that they are identical twins, you'll know that they are not exactly the same, even though their genotypes are the same. While they have identical genes, their phenotypes, their characteristics and how they look are going to be very different. Because your phenotype is influenced by lots of different things. Firstly, your genotype. So that's your DNA, your genetic information and your environment. This is going to lead to natural variation in a population. Things that are going to lead to variation in a population are going to be influences like diet, exercise and personal choice. Asexual reproduction is very common in the plant world, strawberry plants, spider plants and in bacteria and fungi. You are going to get a genetically identical population. As these are dividing by mitosis. So all of the daughter cells are going to be the same. The advantages of sexual reproduction is that you'll get a genetically diverse population. Which means they're going to be better protected from diseases. The counter to that is that a disadvantage of asexual reproduction is that you're going to get a genetically identical population. So that if a disease comes along and one plant is susceptible, chances are all plants, the whole population or animals are going to be susceptible and they're all going to be wiped out at once. 
an advantage of asexual reproduction is that there is only one parent, meaning that the plant or the animal doesn't have to wait around for a mate to turn up, whereas with sexual reproduction, a mate is required. And sometimes this can be quite hard to find, especially in sparsely populated locations. Another advantage of asexual reproduction is that the energy is conserved. And what I mean by that is that the parent is putting all of its energy into conserving its own genes. So this is like the selfish gene, it wants its genes, its genetics to be continued, as opposed to continuing putting energy into something that only has half of its genes. In meiosis we are going to have two divisions. So our chromosomes will line up, they will sort themselves down the middle, there will be a little bit of crossing over going on. So they will swap chunks of their chromosome to increase the genetic diversity. They will divide into two, then they will line up and divide into two again. And you'll notice that each of the cells have half the number of DNA as the parent cell. Mitosis will lead to two identical daughter cells, whereas meiosis will lead to four different daughter cells. You can remember mitosis goes to T because it has a T in it. Mitosis is used for things like growth, or repair, whereas meiosis is used for sexual reproduction. So these are going to be gametes. In mitosis we are going to end up with diploid cells and in meiosis we are going to end up with haploid cells. Haploid cells having half the number of DNA as the original cell. We can work out the chances of a disease or a phenotype being passed on by doing a genetic cross. These are one of the things that I think should be laid out very formally and very properly. So mother's genotype, big R, little r. Mother's phenotype is a carrier. Father's phenotype, big R, little r. Father's phenotype, a carrier. Mother's gametes, R, 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 R. Now we can move the mother's gametes over here, R, R, and the father's down here, R, R, and then fill in these ones down and these ones across. So the mother, R, R, then this one down, R, R, the father, this one across, R, R, and then for the father, this one across, R, R. Then the offspring are going to have dominant, dominant, so they're going to be homozygous and a non-sufferer. Two of the potential offspring, or half the potential offspring, are going to be heterozygous in the carrier. And then out of the offspring, one in four of them has a chance of being double homozygous to recessive and being a sufferer. Polydactyly is a condition where the people get one, two, three, four, five, six little adorable baby fingers. And it is dominant. So here we have a mother who has two homozygous recessive and five fingers and a father who has a dominant and a recessive and has six fingers. We can feel in the genetic cross, mother, 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 father, 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 father. And we can see somebody who has this dominant disease, if they have... Um, one gene, they'll pass it on, and 50, or that offspring has a 50% chance of also having polydactyly. Cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. 
So as we saw in the first example, if we have two parents that are carriers, there is a one in four chance of an offspring having the disease. If um, only one parent is a carrier, then the chance of the baby having um, a cystic fibrosis are virtually nothing, apart from brand new mutation, and the chance of them being a carrier are 50%. In women, the gametes are eggs, and in men, the gametes are sperm. In a plant, we have eggs still, and that is in the stigma. And then the male gametes in um, plants are pollen. And that is on the stamen. And your chromosomes are in the nucleus and you have 23 pairs. So that is 46 in total. I say 23 pairs because you're going to get one copy from your mother and one copy from your father. So you'll have two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3, two copies of chromosome 4. One from your mother and one from your father. This will allow for you to be homozygous or heterozygous for dominant or recessive genes. If you have inherited two X chromosomes, you're going to be genetically female. If you have inherited an X and a Y chromosome, you're going to be genetically male. There are some phenotypes apart from sex which are sex linked. For example, haemophilia, the gene that causes or lends in haemophilia, is on the X chromosome. Whereas females have two X chromosomes, they're much more likely to have a dominant and a recessive gene. If a male inherits the recessive gene for haemophilia, they have no corresponding dominant gene because they only have one X chromosome. Carl Linnaeus developed taxonomy, which is the study of grouping living things together. We can see on our evolutionary tree here that some things are very closely grouped together and to get to other things you actually have to go quite a long distance. He developed a naming system where we have each um, organism has a two-part Latin name and this will tell us how closely related they are. It's a bit like them having a first name and a second name, a genus and then a species. The genus will be the wide overarching type of thing and then the species will be exactly what thing it is. With each new development in biology, with each new development in genetics, we understand more and more about classifications. So our taxonomy and our evolutionary tree is evolving all the time. The three domain system divides everything in life into three groups, eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea. Eukaryotes are things that have nuclei. Making new copies of cells involves copying DNA over and over again. And if you try copying something down thousands, millions of times, eventually they'll become a mistake. And this mistake might just happen once and then get forgotten, or this mistake might be copied over and over and over again. And if it gets copied over and over again, we've got a mutation and we've got natural selection. All of these changes added together, these small changes, these big changes, this is our theory of natural selection of evolution. Of gradual change happening over time, this theory thought up by Charles Darwin, that means we are more suited to our environment. Darwin's theory is that life, or life that we know these days, has evolved over the past three billion years from the first life, the very, very simple unicellular organisms that were in that slushy puddle. And the way this evolution happens is by natural selection. So that random mutations in genes need some natural variation in a population. So that can be small things like different hair colour, different eye colour or big things like how tall people are. So for giraffes, being tall is quite an important thing because it means they have access to a larger range of food sources. 
And individuals with characteristics which make them better suited to the environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. Whether this is tall giraffes or finches with different shaped beaks or moths that have gone black or have gone white. And the genes for these useful, these desirable characteristics will be passed on to the next generation. Evidence for evolution comes from fossils. Um, not everything leaves fossils because fossils come from the hard parts, the bones, the soft bits are just going to decay away, so won't leave fossils. And we can see um, evolution happening with bacteria because they multiply very quickly, 20 minutes in some circumstances. So we can see changes, um, adaptations for natural selection being passed on and happening very, very quickly. Fossils can show us changes that have happened. And how different animals are related. From these, we can use or draw an evolutionary tree, showing us how closely things are related. So things on one branch are going to be very closely related, and the point where they branch off, that's where they became genetically distinct. When Darwin proposed his theory of evolution, it was very controversial. There were lots of religious objections. This is because he was saying that the earth was billions of years old, whereas that's not what it says in the Bible. And he was saying that we've evolved from monkeys, that we've evolved from primordial soup, and that's not what it says in the Bible. An alternative theory at the time is that acquired characteristics... Uh, so for example if you dyed your hair blonde during your lifetime and you had a baby while your hair was blonde your baby would have blonde hair Wallace worked with Darwin they published a paper together and Wallace was very important when we were talking about speciation due to geography Mendel worked with sweet peas and he discovered or was the precursor to discovering genes or units of information that um, trans inherited units of information. When a single species of animals gets geographically separated, and this could be because they were on different islands or there could be a mountain range that pops up in between them, then we can now end up with a situation where we have speciation, where one species leads to various different species. And this is called speciation. Darwin saw this when he was over in the Galapagos Islands. The finches, small little birds, um, all started off as one population, one species. But as they separated out onto the islands, as they got separated from each other, they became quite different. The main difference was in the uh, shape and length of their beaks as they became more adapted to the food sources on those different islands, so whether they had to dig down deep to get the food, or whether the food was on leaves, whether the food was hard to reach, whether the food was easy to reach. Bacteria divide very, very rapidly. Bacteria that is happy, has lots of food, has lots of space and nutrients, is going to divide roughly every 20 minutes. This allows single mutation to spread through the population really quickly. This is going to allow antibiotic resistance to really easily develop and spread due to random mutations. But if those random mutations mean that the bacteria don't get killed by antibiotics, they're going to be selected for by natural selection. 
and bacteria easily pass from person to person or from animal to person or from animal to animal which means antibiotic resistant bacteria is going to spread really easily. Penicillin has saved many millions of lives, probably yours at some point, definitely mine. Because before penicillin, before the widespread use of antibiotics, people died of very, very common things. Going into hospital to have a simple operation, most of the time was lethal before the widespread use of antibiotics. The smallest infection could kill you. MRSA is a bacteria that is resistant to most antibiotics. Now this happens on your skin, it's there on your skin all the time. If you go into hospital to have an operation, you'll get swabbed for it to find out if you have it. But if you do have it and then you get an infection with it, there are very few antibiotics that you can use to treat it. The development of new antibiotics is very slow. Partly because we've looked for a lot of these in a lot of places and partly because developing new drugs is very, very expensive. So companies are going to spend their time, spend their effort and their resources looking at drugs that are going to make them lots of money. Drugs that people have to take every day for heart disease or diabetes. Antibiotics you take once for maybe seven days and then you don't need them again. So they don't necessarily um, make pharmaceutical companies a lot of money but they will cost a lot of money to develop. Because bacteria divide so quickly, in good conditions they can divide once every 20 minutes, they are going to be very, very susceptible to mutations in their DNA. Completely random changes, which means completely randomly, one tiny bacteria could develop a resistance to an antibiotic. And it only needs one bacteria out of a large collection to become resistant to the antibiotic for it to become a problem. Here we can see an antibiotic sensitivity test. These are the discs with antibiotics on it and you can see the bacteria is growing all the way up to these discs but not all the way up to this disc here. So the role of antibiotics is to kill bacteria. Because the bacteria divide so quickly, mutations can quickly develop. If to the course of any antibiotics, any non-resistant bacteria will be killed off. And any resistant bacteria will survive and grow. This is natural selection in action and soon only resistant bacteria will be left. This is a problem because we are running out of antibiotics to treat um, common complications with. For example, um, tonsillitis um, is easily treated these days. Small infections are easily treated these days, whereas previously they might have been lethal. We use antibiotics far too much. They are given to animals um, daily, habitually in their feed. And this is driving the natural selection, driving the bacteria to mutate. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.